paper was like gold in medieval times. I want tobacco. Sugar. That everything we thought we knew about the world might turn out to be completely wrong. explain away. There is something up on that top floor that's walking around that is not of this world. This thing was coming towards our window and of course my first thought was Jason, you know, how, where's Jason? Is, is he okay? There does seem to be certain places that have a, a kind of energy that maybe facilitates it for the visitors to actually access you. These stories are some of the strangest experiences ever described in the UK. We can't tell if they're true, but they are all recounted by ordinary people. Now, they are your witnesses. This is Micklegate Bar, the imposing main entrance to the ancient city of York. Dating from 1196, it is the place where kings and queens have entered the city for centuries to be greeted by the sheriff, the Lord Mayor, and other local dignitaries. But it has a darker past too. Criminals, traitors to the crown, and others all passed through the gates of Micklegate Bar on the way to their deaths. A ghost story in a historic city like York is by no means unusual. But a group of ghost enthusiasts recently dubbed York Europe's most haunted city. It's a label that suits the city, and it's a claim that some of the visitors to Micklegate Bar would support. There's been talk and stories of uh, ghosts in this place, which is bound to be in an 800-year-old building where they used to put the heads. But uh, I've had the, the experience, if you like, of uh, ghosts. You can't be in here as much time as I am, as long as I am, without coming across the odd experience things that go bump in the night or even during the day. Well, I live in York and I've never been, and you tend to avoid the tourist attractions sometimes, but people say, oh, have you been here, have you been there? And we thought, I had some time free with a friend, and I thought, well, we'll just go and have a look round. It's very pretty from the outside, I thought there must be lots of history, so I'll go in and check it out. The first time I actually came in here was only a few weeks ago, and I came with a group of friends specifically to have a look round and the hope that something unusual would happen. One of my people came in, people I have work here, came in one day and found that the soldiers, with the model soldiers that we have that we sell in the shop, had all been rearranged. Um, that happens quite a bit. The things, the magnets that we have on the shelves, they have a habit of coming down, falling down, and things get knocked over, and we, which you, we can't explain away. One of the centres in this country of paranormal activity appears to be the city of York. There are enormous numbers of ghost reports from the city itself, from just outside, places like Sheriff Hutton and so on. And the best interpret, best guess that I could put on that is that it itself is in touch with its own history. Therefore, people are emotionally involved with its own history. It started in the shop, really. Uh, we were in the shop a few minutes and I was talking to the guy behind the counter and um, this noise went off, this, this man's voice and it sounded artificial anyway. I said, oh, what was that? He goes, oh, it's okay, it's the motion sensor. I said, oh, we must have gone across something. He said, no. He says, it does that all the time. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, it's in there. He said, you have to walk in there to set it off. But we didn't walk in there. Neither did you. Is there someone in there? No. He said, it just does it. It's probably the poltergeist. I thought, okay. I do think that some people are more susceptible to seeing ghosts than other people, whether it's because they themselves have a particular mindset or not, or whether it's because they have some other talent or ability is undecided. The motion sensitive, sensitive um, voice thing set off without anybody moving, and obviously we were the only people back there at the time, we were all some little huddle, we were nowhere near it. There's a guard, a royalist guard, that challenges people. Oi! Who's that? Come here and show yourself which causes a bit of a shock when they go in there, but uh, it causes a shock when it goes off and there isn't anybody near there. And that's happened with Rachel and it's happened uh, to many people who've been in Micklegate Bar. Got up to the first floor and 
I was absolutely convinced I could hear footsteps, absolutely convinced. And uh, I looked at my friend and they looked at me. We never said a word, but it's that, you heard something, didn't you? And I thought, well, it's okay. There'll be people elsewhere in the building, there's three floors, it's, it's fine. Of course, later we found out there was nobody but us, absolutely nobody. Well, I heard initially three raps, like somebody knocking on the floor above us. And I stopped and looked around and said, did anybody else hear that? I'm sure I can hear something upstairs. So Dave said, well, I think it's empty up there. And with that, we heard this footfall and there was definitely footsteps on that top floor. And that Dave shot up the stairs to look and said, there is definitely nobody up here. You can be in this room and you can hear footsteps very clearly walking backwards and forwards. When I first used to come here, I used to go up the stairs to look to see if there was someone there. After a while, you get used to it and you don't bother. A talking exhibit triggered with no one in the room. Unexplained movement of artifacts, changes in temperature, an unseen hand tugging at people's clothes. Some visitors claim first-hand experience. We kept feeling sort of cold spots as we were wandering around, I think on both floors, but then with the nature of the building, we couldn't really say, well, you know, this is something supernatural happening because it is an old building, it, there are drafts, and it is made of some quite thick stonework. It was like um, a column of, of cold. It, it felt like a column just passed through me and around me. It, it wasn't a draft. It just literally went through. It's the strangest feeling. And it, it went through up to about my shoulder. And I absolutely felt freezing cold and even through. It went through my body. That's how it felt. All the time now, I'm starting to feel as if there's someone behind me. And I kept on looking around expecting my friend to be there, but of course, he's not. He's there. And there was nobody there. And everyone knows what it feels like when someone creeps up behind you. And you know they're there without looking. It's, it's You just know. And that's how it felt like. So I'm disturbed all the time. I think there's someone there. There's someone there. And we're still walking around, and I'm still feeling very, very, very funny. And the next thing I know is there's a tuck of my skirt. It's, it's no mistake, my skirt's not caught on anything. You see for yourself that the place here, there's, there's nothing it's going to catch on me. I'm in the middle of the floor. I can feel a tug on my skirt, I can sense the presence. I felt the cold. <laughs> you know, now there is something going on and I'm still feeling really funny. I had a coat on quite heavy sleeves and it did feel like someone was tugging at my sleeves. And at the time I just tried to ignore it, thinking, well, this is a bit corny because we already knew the story. Whilst I was still on that top floor, I, had the f I felt like somebody had walked into me and when somebody catches your shoulder as the bump you. And I sort of got a beery smell like he's a, a drunken man. Or, I have no idea who that was, but there was definitely nobody there when we looked around. One of the resident ghosts we have in here is Sarah Brocklebank, the gatekeeper's daughter. She actually used to live in this building back in uh, 1797. Her father, Thomas, was a gatekeeper, and on her birthday, she played a childish game. She took the keys to the city of York. These are just replicas. She took the originals and hid them so well that no one could find them. It's her ghost or her poltergeist, if you like, because apparently she moves things. I've not been witness to that. But uh, it's her ghost that is trying to find the keys, but is also making herself aware that she's still here. She hid them so well she couldn't find them, so her father lost his job, no good having a gatekeeper who loses the keys. The family were thrown out into the street. She never married, she spent the rest of her life searching for the keys, never found them. And on her 72nd birthday, it came back to her where the keys were. Couldn't get in here to recover them, went to tell the Lord Mayor of York where they were. But before she could tell him, she was so excited, she had a heart attack and died. Took the secret with her to the grave. She's still seen from time to time wandering around this building. That may account for some of the things that happen in here. A lot of the things that happen in this room, in particular, are things that a child will do. They're childish pranks. And quite a number of people, uh, that's happened the other week when there was uh, a number of people here, they felt like somebody tugging, like a small child would tug at your clothes. So that could possibly explain some of the things that happen. They do say that a poltergeist, I understand, is a young child. Is the ghost of Sarah Brocklebank responsible for the strange experiences claimed by some of the visitors to Micklegate Bar? The legend is compelling. The atmosphere is eerie. But is this an example of people wanting to believe in something that doesn't actually exist?
I do think in ghosts that the, that the living play some part in investing some kind of emotion into making those replays and so on. And York, uh, along with perhaps Colchester, along with perhaps places down in Wiltshire and Warminster and so on, are those centres where people are very aware of the ancient history of the place. And I think that plays a part in it. The fact that I'd had my skirt tugged, it's very, a very childish thing to do, isn't it? You know, it's not something an adult's going to do. And the cold was... It was just, it just made so much sense. And I could hear the footsteps as well as if somebody was wandering around. Um, and I just constantly felt there's somebody with me. I don't think there's anything evil here. Um, there's nothing that worries me here, other than the cold. It gets very cold in here. The walls are five foot thick. But uh, I think our ghosts, we're very fortunate. They're more mischievous. As far as I'm convinced, yes, there is something up on that top floor that's walking around that is not of this world. If you spend any time in here, for any length of time, you get around to the feeling that there are things that happen that you can't explain away. It just all fitted. It was just really, really strange for it to fit like that. Whatever the explanation, the ghosts of Micklegate Bar are a magnet for tourists and ghost hunters alike. There are many well-documented reports of close encounters with aliens, but few people experience more than one in their lifetime. Anne Andrews and her two children all claim to be the victims of repeated alien abductions over a period of several years. But are these genuine accounts of alien contact or another entirely different paranormal experience? It began in 1983 when Anne's son Jason was born. We would find him um, missing from his cart. Um, he would sometimes be underneath it. Uh, we would hear him cry in the night and go into his room and find that he'd been, he was at the wrong end of the cot, um, where it was impossible for a, a month old baby to, to get to. Mary Rodwell is a counsellor who deals with people who say they are the victims of alien abduction. She feels Jason's case is authentic. It's absolutely classic abduction, right from the whole parameter of, you know, Jason being born and you know, the, the finding the, you know, him as a baby outside the cot and not explaining it, where I hear that the same thing from other people saying, you know, my son was not in the cot, you know, and I couldn't work it out. A lot of very tangible physical things. I think they've more to lose than they have to gain by claiming these accounts. So it's usually that kind of thing that convinces me that whatever these experiences are, that people like Anne and, and others are, are on the level. They are, they are relating the information as to the best of their ability. But the unusual events happening to Jason were about to take a new and frightening turn. On the 2nd of July, 1987, Jason's fourth birthday, the family would experience a visit they would never forget. Jason had fallen asleep on the couch and suddenly there was a real sort of heavy banging at the door. You know, it was like really really hard you know not like just a normal knocking it was like you know somebody was kicking and, and of course you know my husband he just jumped straight up said who the is that you know doing that to my door and and he just sort of flung the door open and there was nobody there at all and he looked up and down the lane and there was nothing um he came back in closed the door and said to myself my mum well that's odd you know there's nobody there but we'd all heard the knocking um then there was um a really sort of bright bolt of lightning. He just opened his mouth and just started spewing out all these fantastic numbers. It was it was just like a a computer. This went on for a few minutes and as he was talking the numbers um, the banging began again, um, but this time it seemed to reverberate, sort of, you know, it, it got louder and louder and it seemed to be coming um, not just from the front door, but from the windows, the back of the house. Jason just seemed to get up from the couch and he walked over towards the door. My husband restrained Jason and he just literally looked up at my husband um, and just said, but I have to go, they're waiting for me. And the banging all the while was just going on and on. And um, 
it was it was just so strange. It was like, you know, as soon as Jason started to blink, you know, as if he was coming out of this trance-like state, he started to blink. Um, and as he, the more he came round, you know, the more the banging receded. There are fascinating series of events, plus the fact that it involves more than one person. Again, I think the vast majority of, of this type of experience involves a single witness. Um, but it's not uncommon that other family members are involved. Was this evidence of alien visits, or were the family experiencing a different paranormal phenomenon? The house was never the same after that. It was, it, it got really bizarre at times, you know, it was like we had um, a lot of poltergeist activity. The, the cooker would come on, um, the television would switch on, sort of in the middle of the night, and, you know, really blaring. and. It didn't matter if you had the plugs in or out, you know, it would still... It's like everything electrical had a mind of its own. Loud bangs, like someone's crawling over the ceiling, and three loud knocks is a very common one that they will hear. It's almost like what the ETs are doing is saying, this is real, take notice of us. If you take out the content for, for a while and look at the parameters that build up these experiences, you can transpose them onto other uh, paranormal, accounts, paranormal sightings, paranormal phenomena and so on. Uh, so the parallels are there for all to see, it's just the content that differs. Uh, and we've often argued that you know, we could be looking at different sides of the same coin, that they are all interrelated in some way. I still for a long time believed that they were dreams, they were nothing more than nightmares. You know, my, I suppose, social upbringing would not allow me to consider any other possibility. But the stories of alien visits were not just confined to Jason. His elder brother Daniel said he too had strange encounters. My older boy Daniel said, you know, don't you both get it? You know, don't you see what's going on? Can't you understand it yet? He said, he said remember when I used to tell you about when I was little, I used to t tell you about my soldier guy, you know, that used to come and see me. And uh, we said yes, which we'd always thought was an imaginary friend. And he said, well, he said, I know now that he was real. He said, I think I've always known he was real. He said, but he said he stopped coming to see me because he said that they'd made a mistake and that Jason was the one that they should be working with. We were talking to um, experts in the UFO field. Um, we were speaking to people um, about UFO um, alien abductions. We don't know enough to make any quantifiable definition of what they are. We have to be open to maybe all possibilities, but there's certainly a tangible um, interaction and there's certainly a physical interaction. Jason always described the same scenario. Um, he will be lying in his bed he would first of all notice like um, what he was referred to as the big one would rise up through the floor at the foot of his bed um, then he said um, there would suddenly be um, like you know six or eight of the smaller ones uh, he said that he could he could see um, but he couldn't move and he would be taken to another place um, which when he was younger he described as a hospital place um, but he said it was um, always very cold, um, extremely cold. Um, he said it was, he described it as like being laid on like a marble slab, um, something of this, this kind. Um, he said there was always a light coming from somewhere, but you could never see where it was coming from. It was now Anne's turn to claim that she too had been abducted by aliens. She didn't know, I think, that she was an abductee or experiencer to start with. She only thought Jason was. It was only later that she came to an awareness that it affected her and her husband and, and Dan as well. So that was an, um, something for her. But by the time she was corresponding with me and we were talking, it was an everyday part of their lives, something that they'd already come to a certain extent to terms with. We saw what we thought initially to be a star, a um, very bright star. Um, which we didn't take too much notice of, but then when the star started getting bigger and bigger um, and looked as if it was coming straight for our window, um, we did get quite alarmed. Um, we don't remember any more than that, you know, other than sort of the panic that this thing was coming towards the window. 
Um, and of course, we, we woke in the morning just as normal. And then all of a sudden, I remembered. Of course, my first thought was Jason. You know, how, where's Jason? Is, is he okay? I spoke to him um, and I said to him that, you know, we'd seen this really bright light last night. And he then went on to explain that he'd been taken to um, a place. It wasn't a usual abduction this time, which he was relieved about. Um, but then he started to say that he was in a room with hundreds of other people and there was like um, a big like cinema screen. Um, and it was just so weird because I finished off his sentence for him. You know, I told him what was on the screen and what was going on and about the other people there. And he just looked at me and smiled and he just said, oh, I knew I saw you there, Mum. Is this proof of aliens abducting a whole family? Or does it show an unexplained psychic bond between a mother and her children? They'll talk about stuff that would blow your mind. They talk about things that are almost like science fiction, and yet they go into detail. And they have so much depth of knowledge of it, you know full well this is no fantasy. If you talk about theories in general, the theories to try and explain these experiences are largely put forward by the UFO researcher be it in the UK or be it in different parts of the world. It is rare that anyone asks the individuals who've had these experiences what their theories are. Now I've done this recently, very, very recently, to a small group of known abductees, and I've asked them what they believe was the nature and origin of their experience. And surprisingly, not all of them said extraterrestrial. Some believe that they were actually having some kind of spiritual experience. Some indeed think this was ET related, whilst others thought it was some kind of paranormal phenomena. So when it comes to theories, the most popular and the most romantic, if you like, is that we've been visited and by extraterrestrials who are conducting some kind of experiment. But it is by no means the only theory. People always ask how we deal with this situation. I suppose it's like the realisation hits you that um, there's nothing you can do about this situation.